As kids are departing here, let me mention, particularly for parents as you're leaving, give an ear to me as you're walking out, bring your kids next week to first hour, because next week we're all going to gather together, and we're going to hear about three different opportunities that four different individuals in our congregation had in past months to serve the Lord in different parts of the world. So we're going to hear about that, and it's good for parents to bring kids to you also. I hope you hear me as you're walking out. It's good for all of us to hear what God's doing through different members of our congregation in different parts of the world. So we're going to gather here first hour, next, actually upstairs next hour, next week first hour to hear about that, and I invite you, please come. Bring kids too. So let's pray. Father, we have had chance already to pray and to sing and to, to think about you in different ways. And now we turn with opportunity to hear from you, from your word that speaks to us. And I want to say first, thank you, and then ask you for help. We say thank you to you, Father, because if you had not spoken to us in your word, we really wouldn't know what's going on. We really wouldn't know who you are and who we are and what this world is and where it's going, what's coming. We wouldn't know. So we say thank you and we, we give you praise for deciding to speak and to reveal to us what is true but hidden from our short-sighted eyes. So thank you, but then, Lord, would you help? Would you help make clear what's here and help us to think about it, to apply it? Maybe there will be some things here that will be an encouragement to some people and odd for others and unusual, difficult. New information, perhaps, or old reminder. It's going to hit us all in different ways, Lord, but we ask all of us together, we ask for your help that you would first make clear what you have said to us and then help it to, to rest on each of us in the right way, to be applied then by your Spirit to our hearts in ways that grow us up and build your church and bring honor to you. Maybe that means conviction and maybe it means encouragement. Maybe it means both. If you are God, you know. Would you please act? Would you speak now through the scriptures? Spirit of God, would you have your way here in the room, in the individual hearts of each of us in the room, in my heart speaking, in everyone else's hearts listening? Would you have your way within us? Please clear away distraction. I feel it in my own heart easily distracted, that's me. And I pray that you would help us now to, to hear you and to focus. Would you clear away barrier, more than just distraction, things that are in us that want to resist? Would you clear that out of our own hearts? Would you clear it spiritually speaking? Because there is an enemy who doesn't want us to hear and doesn't want us to think and doesn't want us to follow. Would you bind him now, Lord, by your spirit, would you bind him and would you loot his house again today? Jesus said that's what the strong man does. He comes and he binds up, uh, he gets bound up by the spirit, Lord, and I pray that you would do that spirit, that you would bind up this one who wants to hold us captive and that you would set free your people and some who are not yet your people, set us free. So please move here, Lord. Own this time. Own your word. Make it clear. And build your church to the honor of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Turn our attention this morning to the middle of Luke chapter 20 where we find Jesus in Jerusalem 
in what is the last week of his earthly life. For several weeks now, we've been following the tense encounters between Jesus and the crowds at large there, but particularly the encounters between Jesus and the leaders of the nation, the religious leaders of the nation who hate him, have resolved to kill him, and the only question is, how can we get that done? They're working on how to kill him. And so far, their approach has been one of verbal entrapment. They lay out subtle conversational traps related to theology or law in some way. They, they put it out there, they ask Jesus to comment, and then they wait to pounce. And last week, the passage that we looked at in chapter 20, last week the topic was related to the government, to Caesar, to the state. In front of the crowds who hated Rome, the leaders cleverly asked Jesus about the appropriateness of paying the tribute tax to Caesar. Should we pay the tax to Caesar? Does God want us to do that or not? What do you think? Should we do it? They ask Jesus. And of course, being God, he sees what's going on. And he answers in a way that they didn't expect that leaves them marveling and silence. His response was one of, as we saw this last week, affirming the appropriateness of government and the appropriateness of the demands that government places on its people. Caesar, in his case, the state, government, it's legitimate, established by God. And we should render to it, we should give, we should pay to it what we owe it. Beneath God, of course, because, as Jesus also said, we are also to render to God what belongs to him and everything in us. All of us, all of our all is his. So we are always to be, always faithful Christians with 100% allegiance to God. And beneath that, not sometimes beside it, not choosing which one do I follow today, but be beneath that, there is no threat here to the state. Beneath that, we give allegiance to the government. In fact, allegiance to Christ in the government that he establishes makes us great citizens. It's supposed to turn us towards the state as citizens who are good, who are not disobedient and subversive, but who are good and sacrificing and loving and serving citizens because we view our service to and in and within the state as service to God who established the state to do good and suppress evil. So this was his response. And we looked at this last week and saw how that shut down one group. They didn't know what else to do, what else to say. And so they kind of stepped back. And then our, we come to our passage today where a different group steps forward and says, essentially, you know, tag, you're it. Now we'll try. And the Sadducees come forward. It's our passage today. The Sadducees are another religious group. They are the opponents of the Pharisees. They, we don't get as much about them because they were smaller and and less influential. But there was a, a theological power struggle between these two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They did not like each other except when they both agreed to dislike Jesus. They also want to disprove Jesus as the Messiah, and so they're going to disprove his knowledge of the Bible. And they're trying to separate him from the crowds. If the crowds realize Jesus doesn't know his Bible, the crowds will realize Jesus can't be the Messiah. And so they pick one of their, their pet topics. We're told in the passage that the Sadducees did not believe there was a resurrection of the dead. When you die, that's it. Nothing follows. That's what they thought. Similar to many people today, in fact. But they thought this because of how they read their Bible. They thought this, they also did not believe in angels, and they, they came to these conclusions because they believed the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, were the Bible. And they didn't find it taught there, resurrection. And in fact, they thought that what Moses taught made it impossible for there to be a resurrection, an afterlife. So they bring this up with Jesus now, so as to prove him wrong and mistaken in regards to Moses. So that's the context. And it, it sits obviously in this back and forth, this entrapment, this, this hunting of Jesus. So we understand what's going on there, the context, but we're actually going to consider 
we'll be looking more at the, at the content, actually the content of what they discuss, because that's what will have influence, impact on our lives today. They're going to talk about an afterlife and marriage, and that's what we're going to look at today too. So I understand the context, but we're not actually going to talk very much about the, the back and forth, the, the hunting, the entrapment of Jesus. We're going to talk about the topics that they bring up. Let me read the passage. This is in Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 27. And there came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they all no longer dared to ask him any questions. Luke 20. So here's the first observation. There is a life to come after this life. There is a life to come after this life, a life in eternity, which is, in fact, the issue and dispute when they're talking about resurrection. Sometimes we hear the word resurrection or, or we say it or we read it, and we have in mind a one-time event like the resurrection of Jesus that happened in a moment, an event that happened at that time and place. But the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sadducees and Jesus both mean something a little different, something larger than that, something that begins at an instant, a resurrection instant, and then goes on eternally after that. You can see it in their concluding question of verse 33. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? They don't mean at that moment, they mean in the life that follows, whose wife will she be during that time? So the discussion here is really about the existence of an afterlife and especially the existence of a blessed afterlife. A life, a coming time, a coming age of life under the blessing of God. We might call it eternity with God in heaven. If you're thinking about a flow chart, everybody comes back to life, and we're only talking about one side of what happens then, eternity blessing with God. There's another side, not with God, that's not under discussion here this morning. Jesus already said plenty about that, but this morning they're all assuming, given that we are the people of God, they're assuming that, you talk about there will be a life after this life with God forever. Okay, how about this? They bring up something that was probably uh, one of their commonly disputed topics. They think that they can show from what Moses taught in Deuteronomy 25.5 that this is all hogwash. Deuteronomy 25.5, an example that's a hypothetical one they bring up here, related to what Moses taught about what's called leveret marriage from the word husband's brother. Moses taught that if a husband dies childless, 
The husband's brother is supposed to marry the widow himself and have children with her, which, no two ways around it, to us today sounds odd. Okay. In our culture, that's unusual. In their culture back then, not odd, and in fact, an important right for the woman. All the hows and whys of that are beyond us this morning, but suffice it to say that everybody understood this, everybody agreed with it, Moses taught this from God, it was important, we should do it. And they say, so it happened, Jesus, seven times over. She had seven legitimate husbands, and then all eight of them, now dead, they all come back to life in the future sometime. You can hear them laying this on here. The resurrection comes like you all say it comes. Well, which one of her seven legitimate husbands is she married to for the time of eternity? Now, we're going to talk about marriage in a moment. That's the next point. And we'll see that Jesus responds assuming that there is a current life now and a life to come, two ages, this age and that age, the resurrection. He assumes that, but here's his evidence. Look at verse 37. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. There are other passages he could have gone to that might seem more clear to us. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, that's extremely clear. Passages in Psalm 16, Isaiah 53, there are other places that we might choose to go to, but he picks Moses. Why? Because they only believe Moses. He goes to the book of Exodus, the story of the burning bush. Okay, so what did Moses say? Do we find anything, guys? Do we find anything in Moses that gives us evidence that people that, from our perspective, who are dead, actually, from God's perspective, still exist. They didn't just cease to be. They still exist, and they will at one point exist again in something that we would call alive, as sentient beings, the senses that work, living. Is there anything in Moses that shows us that when you die, you don't cease to be, but you are and will live again? Yes, the encounter with the burning bush, Exodus 3. Moses writes there, these are the words God said to me when I was at the bush. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he didn't say it once. He said it numerous times all through that chapter, all through that encounter as God's laying out for Moses his plan to deliver his people from Egypt. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. What are we supposed to take from that? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been dead for centuries. And yet God still thinks of himself as being their God. They are alive to God. Dead to us, but alive to God in some way. He is still relating to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the first thing we see here is I am the God, not I was, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But there's more here. Because God, at this moment, in that story, at that moment is intervening with Moses and therefore with enslaved Israel. Remember, Israel was enslaved in Egypt at the time. He is intervening with enslaved Israel to keep his covenant promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob centuries before. He's saying that the whole exodus, the deliverance from Egypt to the promised land is about to happen because, in fact, I am the God of living people. Not, not dead ones. I'm the God of people who are still alive and I made a promise to them and I still am going to keep that promise that I made to them. If they did not exist anymore, the 
promise that I said, I'm going to give you this land and I'm going to put you in it and this will be your place. That, that promise goes away if they aren't anymore. But I made a promise to them, they're still alive, I'm still their God, and I'm going to keep it now. Nothing about their death breaks that connection that they have with me, nor breaks what I swore to do to them. Whether it takes centuries or millennia, I will bring them to rest like I promised them. That's why I'm going to bring these people out of Egypt. In the context of his dispute with the Sadducees, this is a profound argument, and we see there at the end, this puts an end to it. After this, everybody says, we're, we're done. This whole idea of trying to trap him, he is the teacher of Israel. We can't touch him, we're done. And they're going to go to some other tactic and try to entrap him. This is a profound argument to them, given Moses, given the context of Exodus, given how they think. Hence, I am their God, and the exodus is because I'm the God of living people. I'm going to keep my promise to them. So we could think of it in the context of how he shuts down argument. But as I said, we're going to think about what he actually said. There is a life coming. A life after this life. When we die, we do not cease to exist. We live again after we die. So the Sadducees are wrong, and dangerously so. And in fact, many people today are just like them, and are likewise mistaken. Some, maybe this is you, because they deny that there's a life to come. And that's dangerous because if you don't think there's anything coming, you're not going to be ready for it when it comes. But others, and this probably captures most of us here in the room, but others of us, we live unwittingly, I think, in the same place the Sadducees live. If you don't think there's anything coming, you're not living for what's coming. You're living for what's right here. And that's where a whole bunch of us spend most of our mental energy, most of our heart energy, for which most of us spend our resources, our time, our money, We live as if this is all there is. So I, I know, I, I realize, I'm talking to a room full of Christians, and when I say, there is a life to come, a whole bunch of us say, well, okay, that's good. Tell me something else I didn't know. Let me just ask you, do you know it? I'm going to talk to both, both those groups, but, but I feel like I need to kind of like rope in the Christians here to, to kind of keep us thinking about this because myself, as I work through this this week, I got to like rope myself in and keep me thinking about this. When we don't, when we live like this, as if this is what there is, we become both unduly pained by what we meet here and unduly enthralled by what we meet here. We will meet with affliction here, certainly. We will meet with trouble here. And if this is what life is, and there isn't another life coming that's actually forever, for which this one is leading us, from which this one we are led to, if there isn't anything coming, then this is what there is. And if this is, if this is hard, if this hurts, if this sucks, that's how you think of it. Right? I mean, maybe put in some more, like, clear swear words. That's a quasi-swear word. <laughs> but that's how you think of it, right? This, and if this is what there is, you got ripped off. I'm talking to Christians. 
But you were unduly pained by what this is because this isn't what this is. This is so light and momentary. Something else is coming. And on the other hand, you can get unduly enthralled with this because if it's going great for you, this is awesome. And you'll live for it. And you'll spend every last dollar enhancing this. And you'll be living it up in this. And you're going to realize, man, should have banked something on the future. So Christians, we need to think about this too. But, but first, there are many people who just set this aside like the Sadducees overtly, deliberately, and, and deny it. Not because of how they read their Bibles, but probably because they don't. This is, the com- this is a common view of our world today, that there is nothing after this. We just, we're just gone. Well, I can't, I can't engage with that viewpoint exhaustively, but let me, let me, if that's you, let me ask you to think about a couple of things. First, the Scriptures teach otherwise. There's something coming. Jesus teaches otherwise. There's something coming. And if you stop and, and look at your own heart, maybe not every day, but often, if you even look at your own heart, or you, you listen to other people talk about their hearts, there's something in us that also is teaching us, isn't there something more? Isn't there something more? Isn't there something more? Really? Is that it? I mean, you kind of like force yourself to think it goes away, it ends. You got to force yourself to not think about your dead grandmother because she isn't anymore. but your heart keeps thinking about her. We keep talking about how somebody's watching down on us from heaven. Well, no, they're not if they aren't there, if there isn't such a thing, if they're, if they're just gone. We say, no, nothing happens, but there's something in our hearts that says otherwise. Hard to define, maybe, hard, hard to put your finger on, maybe, but there's something in us, and, and then something in some people's experiences where they meet something that's other. What is that about? Well, Jesus, the Bible says that what that's about is you're, you're in touch a little bit with the life that's coming. There's some teaching there from the scriptures. There's some, something being taught you even in your own experience. But beyond teaching and beyond hard to put your finger on experiences, there is the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus. You've got to face that. That's not a teaching. Any more than the Battle of Gettysburg is a teaching. It happened. Now, obviously there's a bunch of Christian teaching explaining what that means. And the teaching that explains what it means is that when Jesus himself, dead, came alive out of the grave, what he's trying to not just teach us but show us in his existence is that the resurrection, the next life, has begun in seed form. The door to the next age has been kicked open. We're not there yet, but if you look at the resurrection of Jesus, you can see through the door and you can see something's coming. Something's coming. If you have, to this point, like the Sadducees said, no, nothing's coming. I just invite you to think about that. It's important. Because it's coming, but not everyone gets there. Verse 35 has an important warning in it. Those who are considered worthy to attain to that age... That is the resurrection of the dead. Again, think of the flowchart. Everybody's raised, but he was talking about just the one side of it, the resurrection of the dead, the life with God in blessing. There's another life coming, but he's talking about the life with God in blessing, those who are worthy to attain it. We all die. We all come back to life. We all face a judgment. And some will be considered worthy to attain this life. And some won't. How will he judge? How 
How will he decide, you, come to life with me, come to live with the blessing of God, you, to wrath? How will he judge that? The world over, the religions of the world, the human heart says, by my good works. And the Bible says, no, because we have no good works. The Bible is clear. There is no one worthy. No, not one. In ourselves, in our sin, we have no hope of standing before God the judge and being declared worthy of life with him. He is the one who is holy and who cannot dwell with unrighteousness. And we are unrighteous. Our only hope is Christ himself, who is not just the teacher who tells us about this, but who is the one who provides for us the righteousness that we must have if God the judge is going to declare us worthy. Christ is the only one worthy of life. He's the only one clean. He's the only one righteous. And he came to earth and offered up a great trade. I'll take your sin and I'll give you my righteousness. I'll give up my life so that you may be counted worthy to live. This is what he did on the cross. He paid for our sin. And this is what he gives to all who trust him. There's a life coming. But only those who trust Christ are counted worthy to enter. Is that you? I invite you to come. This is your only hope. But it's a sure hope. You can find life and be counted worthy in Christ, trusting Christ. Now, the Christians among us here, which I know is, is most of us, Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see that there's this, this life that's coming? It is, it is so common for us, as I've said already, it is so common for us to live, to live with, with a temporal perspective and to see this as the place in which, in which we live, to see life found here and to be either pained by it or enthralled with it. But there is something coming after this life which you could not have in yourself. But look at, look at this. This is a profound testimony to the grace of the love of God for you. Here's the life that you would not be counted worthy to enter into. But God himself sent his son to open your eyes to him and to show you this is where you can live with me and this is how you can get there. And in fact, I'll provide the way in. This is all of God, all for you. This is amazing. This is amazing. It is an amazing hope that you, by the work of God in Jesus, have been brought into a life that never ends. Verse 36 says, you're never going to die again. This, this, uh, this one doesn't end. This, there's a life that ends and a life that begins and goes on forever. And there you live, never dying again, living forever as a son of God, a child of God. Think what that means. Because of Christ, God counts you worthy to come in and be his child. To be intimately united with him and to experience all the bounty of his house laid at your disposal, endlessly, never going away, never diminished, never supplanted, never surpassed. Glory, yours, by the work of God for you. If you could live, not like this, but if you could live like this, and may the Spirit of God do this work in you this morning to cause you to live like this, and you could see that life is coming, that life will never end, that life by the glorious, gracious, loving work of God I have been brought into, I will live there, then what's here will take on right perspective. 
You must live with this perspective. You can live with this perspective. What a blessing to you to have this perspective because it will keep you from being pained or enthralled with what is not ultimately hurtful and not ultimately that great. Men and women, what God has done for you to make you worthy in Christ, to deliver you into his family, count you a child, bring you to life with him forever and ever and ever, is so kind, so good. Lift up your eyes and see the life that is coming. You know it's coming. Lift up your eyes and see the life that's coming and cry out every morning, Spirit of God, cause me to see the life that is coming all by what you have done for me. This is the work of the Christian life. I tell you, that's the work of my Christian life, to get up every morning and see the life that's coming, not just this one. May God open our eyes. May God cause us to see in the scriptures. May God cause the spirit of God to, to illumine so that we would see and be thankful and rejoice. I'll say it again. Rejoice always. The Lord is near. Coming. This light and momentary affliction or this light and momentary delight. Light and momentary is going and the life that is forever is coming how blessed are you if, you, if we if we'll see this if we'll grab this if we'll if we'll live with a perspective that's, that beholds that coming age that life lives for then we'll grow in thankfulness and joy and in release what we have here now Released to his purposes. It is important to live with this perspective, this eternal perspective. You are not yet home, but you will be. May God press that into us. The Sadducees gloriously were really wrong. And seeing that will give us perspective on all of life and on one particular aspect of life, marriage. So that's what we're going to turn to in the second point. And understand, I'm not going to say everything there is to say about marriage. I don't know everything there is to say about marriage. There are many other things and other passages about marriage. We're going to talk about some things from this passage that realizing this might help us think about, might help us get about marriage. And particularly, we're going to look at this point. Here's the second observation. Marriage ends in this age because its purpose ends in this age. Marriage ends in this age because its purpose ends in this age. Jesus answers the marriage question that they raised for him by contrasting two ages, this life and the life to come. Verse 34, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. By sons, he means just people because marry and given in marriage is what happens for men and women, which means people. Here in this life, they marry, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, the next life, and raised from the dead, live in the resurrection, like you've been asking me about, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Total difference. In this age, marry and given in marriage. That age, don't marry, given in marriage. Total difference. And remember, though he uses the language of starting a marriage, married and given in marriage, he's not talking about unmarried people here. This isn't about single people and the question of whether or not people who are single in this life will get married in the next life. The whole discussion that they're having is about eight married people. And the question is, which one of those already existing marriages will continue into the next age? And his answer is, none of them. Because the institution of marriage ends. 
That's Jesus' obvious answer. No one is married in eternity because there is no marriage in eternity. So says the Savior. Which may be hard to hear for some of us today. Maybe for a couple different reasons. Some of us may have grown up around religious teaching that says otherwise. And it's hard to hear something like this on the lips of Jesus that is so very different than what you've heard or what you've been taught forever. Everything that you've built your, your religious life around, everything you've, you've built your family's life around. It can be hard to hear that. But it's taught by Jesus, and it's in Matthew, and it's in Mark, as well as here in Luke, where it's been for 2,000 years. It's clear and unchanging. So I would encourage you to think about that. Jesus taught this. There is no marriage in heaven. There is no marriage after this life. And that may make us rethink a bunch of things. Be, be courageous enough to do that for your own good. What does Jesus actually teach? Others of us, though, have never really been taught anything about this, but it's still hard for us because maybe unassumingly, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of us, been in or been around good marriages, we just kind of naturally assume that we're going to go to heaven and going to be with our spouse in heaven. We think of we talk about it at funerals. When, when your grandmother finally dies, we say, now she's going to go to heaven to be with grandpa. And we think of them as married. That's how we think. I'm not trying to pick on grandparents here. I've been mentioned twice. <laughs> so forgive me if that's you. But that's how, we, that's how we think of they're finally going back. They were married sweetly for, you know, my grandparents, 50 plus years. And you think of them as still there by each other's side, husband and wife, right? No, actually not. Now, in the age to come, there is an awareness of this age. And so there will be an awareness. Husband and wife will know they were husband and wife, and they'll, they'll know each other differently, know more about each other. But having been raised into that age with the righteousness of Christ put on us, raised back bodily from the dead, you will not be married there. And it's worth getting this kind of clear in our minds because it may help us sort out and kind of right-size marriage. Marriage is important, but it is not permanent. It is not superior. It is not ultimate. Jesus says there's no marriage in heaven. And, and really, he could have just stopped right there, and that would have been clear enough, and we could move on. But he goes a step further and gives us a little bit of the why, and there may be more to the why, but he gives us a little bit of it here. Maybe we put it the why not. Verse 36, for they cannot die anymore because they're equal to angels, sons of God, children of God, being sons, children of the resurrection. Sometimes angels are called sons of God because being spirit beings, they are similar to God in some ways. And I think so as to clarify that we don't become angels. 
We resemble angels in some ways. We don't become angels. We are sons, daughters of the resurrection. We are bodily raised again. So we're not angels in heaven. We're bodily alive. But we resemble angels in this way. Here's the point. We cannot die anymore. What was sown into the ground as mortal has been raised immortal. That's what the next age of heaven, that's what life in heaven is like. We live there physically with raised bodies, immortal now. And therefore, he says, there's no marriage. How does that relate? Well, let's think about this. What would no more death but only life forever mean for marriage? couple things, both tied to purpose. What's the purpose of marriage now? From the very beginning, the first purpose that we read of regarding marriage was to create and nurture and protect children. First thing said about marriage, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. First page of the Bible. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That is, fill it with worshipers. Fill it with people who, who will be, who be those who husband this physical creation, who care for it as stewards beneath God for his glory. That's the thrust of that commandment there. And then it's repeated after the flood to Noah. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is a huge purpose of marriage, one that is sometimes lost on modern people. We kind of tend to view marriage as 110% about the romantic fulfillment of the adults. Maybe 115% about that. Maybe 120% about that. That's what marriage is for, right? Romance and love, me and her. Not not for that, but that's not the main purpose. The first reason for marriage, according to the Bible, be fruitful and multiply. Children nurtured by the proper image of God. Now, just occurred to me I need to stop and in saying purpose, I, I do not mean to say that in some way, if you don't have children or can't have children, that you are like second class in some way. I'm talking the big picture purpose of marriage. When God brings together Adam and Eve, he says, there, be blessed, be fruitful, multiply. He's saying, here's what I want you to do. And every person will be modified by our, our, our genes. Some of us are unable to have children. That's okay. You're not a second-class citizen in the kingdom. Some of us, for some reason or other, may not have children. I'm not commenting on that. I'm talking about the big picture purpose of marriage, not you. The big picture purpose of marriage here. So it occurred to me I might have just given someone some some heartache on that. I don't mean to. From the very beginning, children nurtured by the proper image of God, male and female together, In proper covenant, faithful love to one another, that's why marriage. To provide a unit that will display the image of God and protect, nurture, raise up children and fill the earth. But with no death, a new heaven and a new earth, And all the people of God already gathered in, raised up, brought to life, no one missing, no one not there yet, no one dying off. This purpose of marriage is no more. Mission accomplished. All the worshipers have been brought in and the earth is filled. This purpose then goes away in a place where there is no more death. 
But there's more. Something else that we find in Genesis from before the fall. Companionship. Union between husband and wife. A helpmate. One for the other. The animal kingdom, this is on the second page of the Bible, the animal kingdom couldn't cut it, and the creation was wonderful but inadequate. Man was alone. So think about this. God brought another to his side, and he then exclaimed in joy, this is the one for me. And the man left everything else and was joined to this, his help, naked, vulnerable, but welcomed, received, embraced, brought near, not shamed, but loved. Openly, knowingly, intimately, understood, known, and embraced with the wide and long and high and deep love that was safeguarded by an everlasting, unbroken covenant promise. I am yours and you are mine. A groom and his bride. But I am talking about Christ and the church. Catch the overlap there. If you track Paul into the New Testament, that's exactly what he does. Because he wants to underline that the meaning of marriage is Christ and the church. Illustrated and personified in the two and in the covenant between them. Illustrated, personified, modeled, pointed to. Marriage is a sign pointing us towards what we're looking for, what we're hunting for, what we need. We need to be welcomed and received and sheltered and helped and loved deeply even when we're known intimately, even when we're known intimately. And marriage was created by God to say to all of humanity, not just people who are in marriage, people who, who see marriage, people who are raised up under, people who live next to it, this is what you're looking for. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. This is how it blesses those around them when it works. Pointing us towards what Christ always was planned to be for his people. A sign showing us where to go and where to find what we long for within us. A sign that always keeps pointing us on further because even the very best marriages, they, they, they represent it, they, they show it, they reveal it, but they always point us on further because all of them are all tainted by sin and every single one of them ends when one spouse puts the other in the ground and walks away again alone. The death of humans in marriage is in fact part of the purpose of marriage. In a sense, it says, keep looking. Keep looking. You thought you had it. It was so sweet. Then you lost it. Because there she lies. It's a sign that it all goes away. And if there's no death and there is marriage, then we're at cross purposes. We've got the sign that never ends, even when the thing signified is present. The sign purpose, the model purpose of marriage ends when death ends, ends in this life. 
You know, you can be driving down a highway or along a major road and you see one of those white and blue signs with a big H on it. An arrow. Hospital, that way. Or you see a brown sign with a little circle and a little flag sticking up and the ball bouncing. Golf course, that way. And you could, but nobody does put one of those little brown signs in the pro shop at the golf course. You will not find one of those white and blue H's on the receptionist's desk in the emergency room. You will not find marriage in heaven. Because the thing the sign has been pointing towards and encouraging you to go press on and seek, you just arrived in it. You're there. Purpose is over. And death will never separate you from that one again. You'll never need to search for it because you found it. You found the spouse you were looking for all your life. Whether you're single or married in this life, we're all looking for that spouse and we will find him if you are in Christ by the grace of God. The sign is over because the purpose has ended. Like all shadows go away when the reality they were hinting at appears in full light, so too does marriage. Because marriage is about whetting our appetite for Christ and showing us that nothing here satisfies even the best of marriages. It creates in us longing and points us forward. It shows us the, the temporality of what runs through our hands and makes us want the thing that will never fail and will never go away. So Jesus said clearly there's no marriage in heaven and that, that helps us right-size it. And then he told us some of why. Either one of those appeals to you, then we should come to this final point of saying, well, what do we do with it then? Well, we, we take marriage and we right-size it. We don't get too pained by it nor too enthralled with it. We don't get too pained by the absence of it or the loss of it. The trouble in it, even if you get to keep it nor are you too enthralled by it if it's wonderful and awesome and great this week or year. Because it's always intending to be pointing you on towards something else. And you're not, if, if you miss this marriage or you lack this marriage, you're not actually missing and lacking what the marriage is about. Christ has come now in part to be, to be husband to you now and calls you on just like everyone else who's married, calls us all on to seek the union with him that we can experience in bit now and fullness then. That's the wedding feast that all Christians have to look forward to and will enjoy forever. So we treasure marriage now. We should repent. And maybe, maybe this is something we all need to think about. We should repent of the ways in which we mistakenly model Christ in the church. And we should treasure this gift that God has given us and we should also hold it lightly realizing it's actually not what we're looking for and it's going to go away. But what it's about is coming in fullness because there is a life yet to come. And Christ will be your all there. That's because he was good enough to save you now and strong enough and faithful enough, even if it takes millennia, even if you die in the meantime, his promise won't be broken. He's the God of you, alive always to him, and he'll carry you home. You'll get there. Let me pray. Lord, would, we, would you put your hand on us now to encourage and convict, to remind, to build up, maybe to tear down. You know what's needed for each one of the people here. 
would you graciously draw near and do that particular needed work in the hearts of those of us here in this room? Will you please build your church? Will you cause us to live in light of the life that's coming? And to view all of the life here, including particularly marriage, to view all of the life that's here now rightly. To live well in it. To live for the life that's coming. Thank you for your kindness. Carry us forward, minister to us and grow us. Build your church and honor the name of the Son, we pray. Amen.